we want to talk for a few minutes this morning about the gifts of grace, God's gifts of grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, going to begin reading in verse 1. While you're finding your way there, a couple of things for you. Uh, first of all, there's a movie that is out this week. It is only in theaters this week. Uh, it's called The Dropbox. It's about a pastor in Korea who uh, learned that people were just throwing away unwanted children. And so he actually literally created a drop box in the uh, wall of his church where people could come and deposit babies that they didn't want. He took them, he adopted them, uh, saved unbelievable number of lives. And uh, there was a uh, producer from New York, a young man, who heard about this and went to Korea and made a documentary about it. And uh, in the course of meeting this pastor and seeing the love of God, he became a believer in Jesus. And so the Dropbox, it is uh, only this week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and Thursday evening. It's going to be in New, Roche in New Rochelle. It's going to be in White Plains at the big theater. I think it's playing in Norwalk as well. But if you just uh, Google the Dropbox, the film, uh, take a look at that. And if you have a chance, go see it this week. And then I just want to say a very quick thank you for your prayers and your giving for phase two. Um, I don't know what happened. I left here late Friday night and we had a canopy over the front door and I came back for service yesterday afternoon and the canopy was gone uh, and uh, we're about to lose the front door. Next week when you come, we'll be coming in and out through these side doors here. So uh, please be patient. Please be careful as you move around the property. We will do our best to uh, put as many signs as we can to help you know where to go. Uh, but just take your time. Use caution. Uh, please help us look out for the kids as we march forward. We're going to be inconvenienced for a little while without our front door. Once we build up the basement walls, we'll be able to put a bridge across and get back to the front door again. But in the meantime, it's going to be a little uncomfortable. So just bear with us. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all your gifts. Anything that you can share right now towards phase two would just be a great help. All right, look with me in 1 Corinthians 12. Let's begin reading in verse 1, and let's talk about God's gifts of grace. 1 Corinthians 12, and beginning in verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God can say, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. All right, let's talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this morning. Thank You for Your people. I pray we would encounter You today through the ministry of Your Word. If your heart agrees, just say amen with me. I want to take a quick poll this morning. How many people here have received already at some point teaching about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You've received teaching, you know what they are. A uh, good number of you, maybe about half of you. How many people have been witnesses to the gifts of the Holy Spirit? You've been in a service when there's been a prophecy or a tongue or interpretation. All right, a lot of you. How many of you have been a recipient of the gift of the Holy Spirit? You've received a word of prophecy. You've received a healing perhaps in your life. How many of you have been an instrument through whom a gift has come. Uh, you've given a word of prophecy. You've prayed for someone. They've been healed. All right, uh, some fewer of you. How many of you would like to see more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit here at harvest time? Amen. I would too. I have two goals for this morning. My first goal is that when we leave here, we would all have a deeper appreciation for the gifts of the Spirit, that we would treasure them, that we would value them, that we would desire them, 
My second goal is that we would leave here activated. And at the very end of our time this morning, we're going to be praying that God would just activate you or perhaps reactivate you in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But let's talk about these gifts very quickly. I have a lot of, this is going to be a crash course. This is going to be the, the fastest crash course you have ever had on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And to help you out, I printed uh, some of my points and they, we gave them out to you at the door. You can follow along if you like. But let's talk quickly about what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? I find that a lot of times we skip right over the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 12. We like to get right to the gifts and read about the gifts. But the first few verses have very important information uh, about what these gifts really are. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? First, I find that they are disbursements of divine grace strategically bestowed on us by the Holy Spirit. We call them gifts of the Spirit. But the word in Greek is charismata. The charismatic movement draws its name from this Greek word charismata. Charis is the Greek word for grace. So charismata are literally grace gifts. We call them gifts of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the key agent in distributing these gifts. But the contents of the gifts themselves is grace from God. The charismata are disbursements of God's grace. They are care packages from heaven that are filled with God's grace. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, when we administer the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when we're used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are actually administering God's grace to people. And what is his grace? His grace is his kindness expressed to us. So when we receive a charism, when we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, we are literally receiving a kiss of kindness from God. We feel that. It gives us warm fuzzies. God's grace is his divine strength transferred to us. And when we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, it makes us stronger. It makes us emotionally stronger. It makes us mentally stronger. It makes us stronger in our will. It makes us stronger in our resolve to follow Jesus. Even it's sometimes physically stronger if the gift that we have received is a gift of healing. His grace is his generous benevolence lavished on us. And when we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, God is lavishing something of real value on us. If you receive a prophecy, you have received something of real value. If you receive a healing, you have received something of real value. If you receive a word of divine guidance, you receive something of real value. And the Holy Spirit bestows these strategically just when he knows that we need them the most. God's grace is given to us from above. It cannot be earned. It cannot be attained. That's why it's called grace. And so it is with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are not abilities to which we can attain in our own strength. They are given from God above as he sees fit. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? They are acts of loving service that Jesus does for us. Paul calls these gifts ministry or service from the Lord. If you think about that, that would really bless you. You know, Jesus said when he was among us, he said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. Peter said that Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Everything that Jesus did in his earthly ministry was an act of loving service, healing sick bodies, Delivering captives to sin, restoring shattered lives, giving peace to anxious hearts. And the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that Jesus still does the same things that he has always done. And now he does it through the vehicle of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is doing good to us. He is serving us. He is ministering to our needs just as he has always done. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Another thing Paul says is that they are encounters with God's presence and power. Paul says that the gifts are the powerful activity of the Father. 
When we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, we experience God's living presence. We experience His great power. And I want to tell you, encounters like that change us forever. Encounters like that convince us that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. There have been numerous times that I have been the recipient of a prophetic word where God has repeated back to me some of the deepest whispers of my heart. Things that I prayed to God in privacy of the prayer closet that only God could have known. And the Lord has used a human instrument to speak those words back to me precisely the way that I uttered them to God. How many of you have ever had that experience? A few of you have. I want to tell you, when you have that happen, you know that the God of heaven hears you. You know that he has heard you. You know that he knows your name. You know that he has your address and that he's paying attention and encounters like that with his presence change us what are the gifts of the holy spirit they are beneficial to everyone present when they're given out paul says that the gifts are distributed by the holy spirit for the good of everybody and you know it's true certainly the recipient of a gift benefits from it. If you received a healing, you benefit from it. If you receive a prophetic word, you benefit from it. But I want to tell you that it's not only the recipient, but it's also the instrument through whom the gift comes that benefits. The love of God, the grace of God, the power of God that is ministering through that person also ministers to that person who delivers the gift. I have been a recipient of the gifts, I have been a witness of the gifts, and I have been an instrument of the gifts. And I want to tell you, being God's instrument is more fun by far. And the witness of the, of the, the gifts benefit too. They catch the overflow of what God is pouring out in the room and their faith is built. When the gifts are being distributed among the body, everyone gets something good from God. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Another thing I find is that they are only found in the church of Jesus Christ. Paul reminds the Corinthians of their pagan past. In pagan temples, people had all kinds of ecstatic spiritual experiences. They fell into trances. They gave prophetic oracles. They even spoke in tongues. But Paul wants the Corinthians to to know that those spiritual experiences are not at all the same as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that pagan statues are mute. We were in the city of Yangon in Myanmar and we went to the National Pagoda. It's a massive structure, many, many, many stories high. You can see that pagoda from anywhere in the city of Yangon. The top of it is hundreds of tons of solid gold, massive structure. And around the central pagoda, there are a thousand small pagodas all covered in gold. And each one of them holds multiple statues of Buddha. There were hundreds and hundreds of people lying prostrate, bowing, giving offerings before these statues of Buddha. And my heart was so grieved. It took us, really took us a couple hours. This thing is so massive to walk around the circumference of the whole thing. And I'm watching all of these people bowing and prostrating themselves and making offerings of incense and flowers to statues that have ears that cannot hear and eyes that cannot see and mouths that cannot speak. What a wonderful pleasure and privilege it is to worship the living God who has a mouth through whom he speaks to his people, who hears us and who responds to us. But Paul says behind those dead statues, there are demonic spirits who create counterfeit spiritual manifestations. The real gifts of God's grace can only be found where Jesus is believed on and where Jesus is exalted as Lord, as the one true God. The ecstatic spiritual experiences of Hindus or Buddhists or spiritists or shamans or any other group cannot be compared with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are not the same. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? They are for every believer in Jesus. Three times in chapter 12, Paul says that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts to each one in the body. That means that every one of us is a potential instrument 
through whom the gifts might come. Any believer can be used in any of these gifts that we read about at any time. And I need to add here that it's not our choice what gift God uses us in. You know, we might think, well, I would love to be used in the gift of healing. I'd love to be able to pray for my family and my friends who are sick and see them healed. But giving messages in tongues, yeah, that's not so much for me. You know, we don't get to choose that. Paul says that God is the one, the Spirit is the one who chooses which gift he will manifest through us. And I have learned with God the hard way that if you say, I will never do that, usually it's the first thing that God makes you do. Right along with that, Paul says that the gifts are something that we should all eagerly desire. Four times in these chapters, Paul says, eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We should look forward to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We should look forward to experiencing them when we come together. We should look forward to the fruit that they bring. We should look forward to being used as an instrument through whom these gifts can flow. You know, that's my prayer for today. My prayer is that somehow the Holy Spirit would take these simple words and he would awaken within our hearts the desire to be used in the gifts, to see them operate among us. When I was in college, the only person who sent me care packages was my Nana. She sent them to me every other month like clockwork. She sent a little food. She sent a, a little bit of money, a couple dollars and a card. My grandmother loved comics, and so she would cut them out of the newspaper, and she'd put them in the care package. I always looked forward to her care packages. They made me feel loved. They were full of things that I enjoyed. They were full of things of value. There was one thing that was a bit odd, though. My Nana was constantly sending me underwear from Sears. <laughs> I don't know whether she thought that I wasn't washing my underwear. I don't know whether she thought that maybe I was wearing my shorts out because I was in classes so long. But after a while, I had a closet full of unopened packages of underwear. And I didn't have the heart to tell her, Nana, please stop with the underwear already. One day, a friend of mine had an idea. He said, Glenn, why don't you see if Sears would let you exchange the underwear for something that you can use? So I took this huge shopping bag full of unopened underwear packages to Sears, and I said, could I exchange these for something else? And the lady said to me, sure, you can exchange them, or I can give you a cash refund. Ding, 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 ding. There is nothing that college students need more than a cash refund. And after that, I look forward to Nana's care packages more than ever. Send the care packages, bring on the underwear. You know, that's how God wants us to look forward to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They remind us that we are deeply loved by God. They're full of good things for us to enjoy, and they are very, very valuable. So let's take a very fast look. This is a crash course. I'm going to give nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in nine minutes. This is going to be a miracle that's going to happen right in front of us. But let's talk about these gifts. Maybe you have been taught that there are only nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you that there are many more than just nine. There are four passages in Paul where he gives lists of gifts. Uh, this is one of them. There's another one in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Romans 12, Ephesians chapter 4. There is a smattering of gifts throughout all of Paul's letters. There are gifts that are mentioned in other letters. Peter and John talk about different gifts of the Spirit. Uh, there are two gift lists in chapter 12. I only read one of the gift lists in this service. So maybe you've been taught that there are only nine. There are many more than nine. But let's look at these first nine, if you will, in the verses that we read this morning. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? First is a message of wisdom. A message of wisdom. This is an inspired message that contains divine guidance. It can be for an individual. It can be for a group. It can be for a whole body of believers. Beloved, listen to me. This is not the gift of wisdom like what God gave to Solomon. This is not common sense. This is not the gift of good advice or wise counsel. This is a message of wisdom. It is an inspired verbal utterance 
that contains divine guidance in a time of need or in advance of a time of need. Many, many examples in both Testaments. God gave Joshua a word of wisdom for getting over the Jordan River. He gave Joshua a word of wisdom for uh, taking down the walls of Jericho. Let me just share a couple quick things that happened to us here at Harvest Time. In 2004, we just moved into this building and uh, we couldn't make the mortgage. Uh, it didn't look like we were going to make it financially. And we fasted and we prayed. And I got a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Pastor Melanie arrived on my doorstep and the Holy Spirit said, open the door to her, start a Spanish church, and you cover all of their expenses. God asked us to give out of our need, but it was a word of wisdom that came from heaven. And when we obeyed it and we gave out of our need, he came and he met all of our needs. We received the biggest gifts that year that we had ever received up to that point in our history. In 2007, Holy Spirit spoke to me three times to get moving on phase two. I got our architect and our attorney together. We thought we were going to have to buy more land before we could build phase two. And we found out quite by accident that there was a temporary loophole in the zoning regulations in the town of Greenwich. And we were able to get phase two approved. We were able to bump up the number of seats to 1,000. We were able to put a basement under the entire thing and add all the parking lot without buying any more land. It was a word of wisdom. 2008, I was in an evangelical conference in Chicago. I happened, really, we were at this cocktail kind of hour thing. I don't know, evangelicals, we don't drink cocktails. We had juice. I don't know what it was. But I bumped quite by accident, bumped into another Assemblies of God pastor, an older man. We were the only two Pentecostals in the room. And he ended up putting his hands on me and giving me a word of wisdom that related to the acquisition of the parsonage just down the street. And when I got home, everything that he told me happened just as he said. Those were three key uh, moments that the word of wisdom guided us and we had direction from heaven and God blessed it and came through. All right, grouped with a message of wisdom is a message of knowledge. This is an inspired message containing information that could only be known via God. Again, this is not the gift of knowledge. This is not knowing a lot about a lot. This is not the Pastor Nick gift, all right? Uh, this is an inspired verbal utterance that contains information that the speaker could not possibly know except by God. Jesus exercised this gift when he met Nathaniel. He said, Nathaniel, just before we met, you were sitting over the fig tree. He met a woman at the well and he said to her, you've had a revolving door of broken relationships, five divorces, and the man you're with now is not even your husband. For both Nathaniel and the woman at the well, the word of knowledge opened their heart to receive the ministry of Jesus. That's exactly what the gifts do. Paul says in chapter 14 that when the secrets of someone's heart are laid out like that, that their heart is open to receive Jesus. From these two speaking gifts, Paul shifts next to three action gifts. The next gift is the gift of faith. This is a special God-given ability to believe God for extraordinary outcomes in a moment of need. The gift of faith is a little bit different from saving faith. It's a little bit different from the ongoing faith that we exercise as believers. This is a special burst of faith that is given at a time when it is needed. Paul calls it in chapter 13, faith that moves mountains. Elijah had this gift on Mount Carmel. Daniel had this gift in the lion's den. Actually, archaeologists found the lion's den where Daniel was, and they found that he took a selfie with the lion and uh, left it behind, and there it is. Paul had this gift during a hurricane at sea. There were seasoned sailors who were in fear of their life. And Paul is sound asleep. And when he wakes up, he comes up on deck in the middle of this horrendous storm. And he says, be of good cheer. I believe God and it will be just as he told me. And by the way, after exercising the gift of faith, Paul gave them a word of wisdom, a word of divine guidance, telling them exactly what to do to survive the shipwreck. And not one of their lives was lost in the storm. 
Two occasions stand out in my mind when I experienced the gift of faith. One was when I prayed for a woman who was healed dramatically of paralysis. Another time was when I prayed for a man who came instantly out of a coma when I laid my hands on him. And in both of those instances, I knew in advance because of the gift of faith, I knew that when I touched them, they were going to be instantly healed, and they were. Along with faith is gifts of healings. This is inspired prayers, proclamations, and or actions that release healing miracles. What's interesting is that uh, Paul uses plural words here. This is not the gift of healing. It is many gifts of healings. That says two important things. First of all, it says that for every type of bodily sickness and every type of disorder, there is a gift of healing available to meet it. Beloved, listen to me. God is a cardiologist. God is a neurosurgeon. God is an endocrinologist. He is an infectious disease specialist. He is a dentist. He is a maxillofacial surgeon. He is an ophthalmologist. He is a hematologist. He is a vascular specialist. He is a fertility specialist. He is a urologist, an oncologist, a podiatrist, an orthopedist. There is absolutely nothing that God cannot fix. Second, if there are so many gifts of healings available, then we are surely not seeing as many healings as we should or as many as we could. Maybe we're not asking enough. Maybe perhaps we're not giving the Holy Spirit enough opportunity to move among us. Maybe we're not taking the time to find out in advance what God wants to do when we gather together. I want to fix that. I want to change that. How about you? Well, what have we started praying? What have we all started praying to, together before we came on our way here? God, what do you want to do today in the midst of your congregation? God, who do you want to help? Who do you want to set free? Who do you want to heal today? Father, show us. Along with healings is workings of miracles. These are inspired actions that release divine intervention. Jesus turned water into wine. That was a miracle. Jesus multiplied bread and fish. He rebuked a demonically induced storm. Paul struck a sorcerer blind. He withstood the deadly bite of a venomous serpent. Just like gifts of healings, this is workings of miracles. For many kinds of crises, there are many kinds of divine help available. The Lord reminded me of a miracle story. I don't really know why I haven't thought of it in years, but I just feel like somebody needs to hear this. Many decades ago in my old Bible college, a fire broke out in the school kitchen one afternoon. It was a grease fire, I think, and somebody, I think they took whatever it was, threw it in the sink, and it just, whew, and it started to climb up the walls and billowed onto the ceiling. And just when that fire combusted, our president's wife walked through the kitchen door, and she stretched out her hands towards the fire, and she said, in the name of Jesus. And the cook and the kitchen staff said that that fire came together in something that looked like a tornado, a funnel, and it went right down the drain of the kitchen sink and disappeared. When they took wet cloths and they wiped the walls and the ceiling, the soot wiped right off and there was no fire damage underneath whatsoever. I don't know who that story is for, but I feel to tell you this from the Holy Spirit. If you're walking through the fire, God says you shall not be burned in Jesus' name. From these three active gifts, Paul goes to four more speaking gifts. Next is prophecy. Prophecy is an inspired message from God. It can be directed to an individual or to a group. Prophecy may include information about the future, about God's plans for you. Often it does. God sent Ananias when Saul was blinded on the Damascus road. God sent Ananias to prophesy over Saul 
and tell him the future ministry plans that God had for him. Agabus prophesied over Paul that he would be arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. Paul said that Timothy, his son in the faith, had prophecies that went before him. In other words, prophecies that were made that spelled out God's future ministry and intention for Timothy. But prophecy isn't always predictive in nature. It could be any message from God that is spoken under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy can occur during a sermon. It can occur during a Bible teaching. It can incur, uh, occur during a spirit-inspired song of worship. In fact, Levites, uh, people with the gift of bringing the presence through worship, prophesy on their instruments. Prophecy can occur through spirit-inspired prayer. Prophecy moves people to take action, sometimes corrective action. It encourages people. Prophecy builds people up. It builds up their faith. And here's the really good news. You do not have to dress up in camel hair and eat locusts and honey like John in order to be used in the gift of prophecy. To that you should say, Amen. Amen. Number seven, come worship team and help me. Distinguishings of prophecies or of spirits distinguishings of prophecies or of spirits. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, Paul uses the word spirits as a synonym for prophecy. So this gift specifically is divine insight into the origin and the validity of prophetic utterances. Beloved, listen to me. Discerning of spirits is not discernment. It is not the ability to judge character. It is not the gift of suspicion that so many operate in. This is divine insight into the spiritual dynamics behind a message. John uses the same language in 1 John chapter 4. He says, test the spirits to see whether they be from God because many false prophets have gone into the world. So this is divine insight into whether the origin of something is divine or demonic or whether it's human in origin. Paul exercised this gift in the city of Philippi when he was being followed by a little slave girl. She was shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. They are telling you the way to be saved. Now listen, the words that the little girl were saying were right. They were servants of the Most High God. They were telling people the way to be saved, but the spirit behind her words was not right. Because there are people who are saying words that sound right, but the spirit behind those words are not right and want to uh, just put a, a, a lasso around us and lead us off into deception. So we need this gift. God, show us the origin of things and the validity of things. All right. Number eight, speaking in different kinds of tongues. Going to talk about tongues next week. Tongues is a gift that accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But here, Paul is talking about a message in tongues, an inspired message during a public worship service. This is when the Holy Spirit inspires someone to speak in a language that the speaker does not know and that the hearers do not know. Paul calls these tongues of angels. In other words, they are languages that are not known on earth. However, on occasion, people do speak in languages that are not known to the speaker, but there might be someone in the room who understands the language. On one occasion, my wife, Denise, spoke in a very rare dialect of Chinese, and there happened to be two people sitting directly behind her who understood this dialect of Chinese. My wife didn't know this language, but they were amazed, and they didn't know how she could possibly know this language and she was telling them the way of salvation in the tongue that she was speaking. In my home church growing up we had someone speak in Japanese one day. They did not know Japanese but there were two visitors from Japan in the service who gave their hearts to Christ because they delivered a salvation message. Here at Harvest Time we've had people speak in Arabic. They didn't know Arabic but there was someone next to them who did know it and understood them. We've had people speak in French, some other languages that they didn't know but there were hearers who knew. All right, messages in tongues must be accompanied by interpretation of tongues. This is not a word-for-word -word translation, but it is a spirit-inspired paraphrase that captures the heart of a message of tongues that has been given. 
The interpretation can be given by the person who delivered the message in tongues, but more commonly it's given by someone else. And I would just say this, you know, the net result of tongues and interpretation is the same as if someone has given a word of prophecy. And Paul calls prophecy a greater gift. But I would say, let's not throw out tongues and interpretation. Because for one thing, if you've never been used in a gift of the Spirit, it's a lot easier to respond to the impulse to give a message in tongues than to give a prophetic word. So messages in tongues are good on-ramps for people who have never been used in a public worship service before. And they have a sign value all their own. They have something special. Some of you know our friend Denny Kramer. He's a prophet, a true prophet. When he was 20 years old, he was in college. He was dealing drugs. He was doing drugs. And he stumbled one day high into a Pentecostal church. How he ever got through the door of the church, I'll never know. But he's standing there high, and he's looking around the room. And the people in the room were so joyful, he thought they were all high too. He, he looked at one group, and they were so happy. He said, they must be high. And then he looked on the other side of the room, and he saw another group so joyful. He said, they must be high too. This is the coolest church I've ever been in. And then someone gave a message in tongues and an interpretation. And the message was for him. And instantly he became sober and he fell on his knees and he gave his heart to Jesus and he has never looked back again. Beloved, the gifts are valuable. We've talked about what are these gifts. We've taken a quick look at nine of the gifts. Now, for our last few minutes together, I want us to share a time of prayer just to respond to the word of the Lord today. Would you stand with me this morning?